On today's Locked On Jayhawks, deep dive into Kansas basketball transfer target Colby Rogers. You are Locked On Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. You can find me on Twitter at DJohnsonRadio. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. And on today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, we're going over another one of KU Basketball's transfer targets, doing a deep dive on Colby Rogers. The last player we did this on ended up like committing the next day. I, I don't know that that tracker, track record is going to continue here, but uh, we're going to start doing these a little bit more with players who at least there's been some reported interest to some level. Who knows what exactly that is for Kansas. We'll get into that, how we fit with KU, and uh, we'll finish up redoing last offseason to make things better for KU coming into this year. First, this episode of the show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $150 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So who is Colby Ross? Well, Colby Ross is a guard who is just at Wichita State. Really good sharp shooting, scoring, shooting guard, uh, kind of combo guard type from Wichita State. And why are we doing a deep dive on him? Well, I don't have a visit or anything like that. And you know, don't necessarily have a reported offer out there. We There was a report on March 26th, or I guess a tweet you would say, from uh, Tobias Bass of The Athletic that said since entering the transfer portal, Colby Rogers has heard from Alabama, Kansas, Arkansas, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Xavier, St. John's, Nevada, Memphis, USC. So good list of schools there. Um but obviously there's been no new news, but you know, we got to talk about some targets, right? Off season talk, baby. But I do think this kid would be uh, a really good fit in a couple ways for KU. So let's get into that. He is a six foot four guard from Wichita state who averaged 16.4 points per game last season for the shockers. Now, uh, didn't put up a ton else, mostly a shooter and a score, 3.4 rebounds per game, which that's fine for a two guard. 1.9 assists, that's not a huge number. One steal per game, okay, that's a solid number. 0.3 blocks per game, that's actually pretty good for a shooting guard. Uh, 40% from the field, 41% from three on 7.1 attempts per game. He was basically taking half as many threes as Kansas was as a team per game last season, uh, a little bit under that, but he was shooting 41% on them and about 83% at the foul line. So not great on two point shots, but most of his shots did come from three and he was electric from three and as a shooter overall. So prior to being with the shockers, cause he was with uh, Wichita state for two seasons, but one of the years he was red shirting, back in the archaic day of when the NCAA made you sit out for transfer rules. So he uh, actually started his career at Cal Poly for two seasons. Uh, I believe he's originally from like the Northeast and he was the second leading scorer on Cal Poly both years. Then he transferred to Siena where he was all MAAC second team. And then he transferred up to Wichita state where he had to sit out a year and then this past year was the year that he put up over 16 points per game on 41% from three on high volume. Uh, how about some of the, the synergy numbers here for Colby Rogers, which makes him really of interest. 84th percentile as a pick and roll ball handler on a ton of attempts, over 150 attempts. So very good operating out of the pick and roll as a score. He ranked in the 87th percentile in spot up shooting, including shooting 45 of 96 that equates out to being almost 47% on spot up threes. And when you're talking about guys who would come to Kansas and, you know, if you're Colby Rogers, you're the guy to score the basketball, at Wichita state, you come to Kansas. Now you have to play more off ball. Now you, you know, and, and part of it is you're going to get open spot up looks, right? I mean, how many did we see Kansas miss that they got open from Hunter Dickinson being guarded in the post or Dewan Harris finding an open man. And then they just clanked the three. Well, you got to be able to hit spot up threes. You got to play off the ball. That is something Colby Rogers still does. Well, again, 87% of 47% on spot up threes this past season for Wichita state. And part of that is him ranking in the 89th percentile in catch and shoot 
uh, opportunities where he was 86th percentile in guarded catch and shoot and 85th percentile in unguarded catch and shoot. You might be saying, okay, what is the difference between spot up shooting and catch and shoot shooting? Well, um, I don't have totally have an answer for you. I believe that more uh, spot up shooting is you're just like waiting in the spot. Like imagine you're just standing there in the corner for the whole play. And then all of a sudden, finally a pass comes your way and you shoot it up. Right. Whereas with catch and shoot, it's somebody passed it to you and then you shot it, which I I think you could still maybe take a dribble in between. Um, Whereas I think with spot up shooting, it's, I don't know, maybe nothing in between. I might have those mixed up. I don't totally know. Either way, he was good at both. Um, If I add in the year he had at Siena, he is 82 of 182 over his last two seasons of college basketball and spot up threes. That is 45% on spot up threes over his last two seasons of college um, in a pretty big sample size. So like this guy is just a knockdown shooter. He's okay in transition, 47th percentile, 50th in isolation. So about average there, 60th percentile off screen. So if you work him off screens, that can work too. Um, but it's, it's that jump shot that is tantalizing for what it could mean for Kansas. Overall, he was in the 81st percentile on all of his jump shots, including being 80th percentile on dribble jumpers. So even if he has to take them off the dribble, not an issue. And he shot 37.5% on dribble three point shots. How many dribble three point shots did we see Kansas be able to make this past year? Right. Uh, felt like all the, at least limited amount of threes that they did make, were off the catch, right? Not really off the dribble, not really creating them as much. And that was something that Colby Rogers could do. So point blank, this is one of the best shooters in the transfer portal. And for a Kansas team that is looking for shooting, yeah, seems like that fit would kind of add up. Now you might be wondering, okay, what about on the defensive side of the ball? Because um, we saw that limit like Nick Timberlake's playing time earlier on in the season. As the season got later, Kevin McCuller gets injured. He gets vaulted into the starting lineup. But earlier on the season, Timberlake was struggling to get on the court. And part of that was the three-point shooting, which was supposed to be a strength, wasn't falling at a high rate until really the NCAA tournament. Um, But Timberlake came in ranking in the fourth percentile defensively at Towson. So Colby Rogers, uh, he was in the 51st percentile defensively this past year at Wichita State. So basically just like a, a nationwide average defender which if that's what you get at Kansas, if you brought this kid on, you get an average defender with a dynamite three-point shooter, you absolutely take that. Now, he was 31st percentile in his year at Siena, but that was three years ago at this point, so it's clear he could have got better. He was 75th percentile the year before that uh, in his final year at Cal Poly. So I I guess basically with the jump up to the Big 12, just view him as being like somewhere between a below average to maybe an above average defender in the best case scenario. If you just want to say he's an average defender, but again, that's way better defensively than Timberlake. And I think there's more dribble shooting. I think there's more spot up shooting than than maybe what Nick Timberlake showed, at least a bigger sample size on it. Um, Maybe the biggest negative you could have with Colby Rogers is that he's never been on a winning team. Like that's something you want to put guys together, but um, I don't think that's all his fault, and he he played well against better opponents, so it's it's not a situation where it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess there, there are so many players on the team that you have to kind of decipher, was were, were you the problem? Was somebody else the problem? And, and I don't think that was the case for Colby uh, Jones. And in 24 career games against Ken Palm top 100 opponents, he shot 42.4% from three. And in 11 career games, I know those are still kind of small sample sizes, but still, uh, against Ken Palm top 50 teams, he's shot 44.4% from three. So he's done well against better competition. And um, he did uh, kind of have up and down in the T-Mobile Center against KU and K-State, but maybe a fun game if you want to go find highlights or, or go back and watch the game. South Dakota State played Wichita State this past year. Zeke Mayo had 25 points in the game, and obviously he'll be at Kansas, so maybe a fun one to watch him there, though he did have a a lot of turnovers. And then Colby Rogers went for 21 points in that game on 5 of 8 from 3. So I'm going to bring this up a little bit later when we get into the fit at Kansas, but I think there is a comp here from Colby Rogers to Jalen Coleman-Lands, who Jalen Coleman lands came in as a guy who was on a lot of teams who weren't, you know, great teams. I think he was on that Iowa state team that like didn't win a single game in conference play, but he wasn't, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. He like, 
he was a team player in a real way at Kansas that he came on. And when KU brought him on, it was almost Ochag Baji insurance. You didn't know if you were going to get Ochai back or not. Turned out you got Ochai back and Jalen Coleman lands played a, a bit of a smaller role, but if Ochai didn't come back, Jalen Coleman lands would have played a much bigger role on that team. But anyway, Jalen Coleman lands was a six foot four guard. It's the same as Colby Jones sniper from three Colby Jones, uh, Jalen Coleman lands, very old player. He was in his like seventh year of college. He was in his mid twenties. Well, for Colby Rogers, uh, th- this is going to be his, um, sixth year of college because of uh, kind of the year sitting out. And so for his career, he has made 39.2% of his threes on 627 attempts. That's actually better than Jalen Coleman lands in his career, who shot 37.6% from three on 859 attempts. That includes his year at Kansas when he shot like 44%. And if you want to cop Isaiah Moss too, because th- there's some similarities there, Moss shot 37.8% from three for his career on 463 tries. So those are against better competition. Jalen Coleman lands at Iowa State and what DePaul, like in the Big East and stuff like that. Um, whereas with you know, Moss, you're talking Big Ten and then Big 12 with Rodgers, a little weaker competition. But this kid is an absolute flamethrower. So for what it's worth, I think if Kansas makes the move to offer, I feel like it would happen. Um, And I don't know if Kansas will or I don't know if Kansas won't. It's probably one of those moves where it's dependent on what else happens in the offseason for KU. I don't think this is, you know, the same one like a Riley Kugel where they were very aggressive going to get it. It's more so, hey, if we end up getting Colby Rodgers because we ended up having an opening, and you know this guy ended up leaving the program or something he would be a good fit in that standpoint but we're not going to move mountains to get this kid at the same point in time but i do think he would be a nice fit for kansas should they look to add him how exactly would he fit in with the team we'll discuss that in a moment game time is our ticket sponsor here with locked on network because buying tickets to your favorite sporting event should not be stressful and it's not with game time because they have killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee means you can stop stressing over the tickets. Start getting hyped for the fun you're going to be having. You know, I, I'm a big like last minute ticket buyer. I'll buy them the morning of the game or I don't know, maybe even a few hours before the game because I'm a believer you can get a little bit better prices, some of that stuff. Well, sometimes that can be a little stressful, especially I remember like five years ago and it's like, oh no, but you know, if I buy them a few hours before the game, we have to print them out. And like, what do the seats look like? All this sort of stuff. Am I getting scammed? The game time, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You can see the images of the seat view. You buy them directly on your phone, on the app. You're good to go. You walk right into the game. It's no stress, no hassle. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on for $20 off the first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. How exactly would Colby Rogers, the Wichita State transfer fit in with Kansas? So, You know, it's it's hard to say um, exactly what the starting lineup might be right now for Kansas. You're still waiting on Johnny Furphy, uh, still waiting on Hunter Dickinson, and, 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 you know, some of these decisions, even if you have a hunch which way it's going to go, it's it's impossible to say until it actually happens. And then, you know, you don't also know, like, okay, is Zeke Mayo going to come in and just hit the ground running and – you know, knock down, be the the starting two guard, or is there a chance Zeke Mayo could be coming off the bench and playing kind of a Remy Martin role, right? Like, uh, so I think with, with Colby Rogers, I think the ceiling here would be you start at the two guard spot. I mean, in theory, you would view it as, Hey, you bring this kid on it's competition between him and Zeke Mayo and possibly El Marco Jackson coming back and LeBaron Phylon for who's going to be. And, and I guess Riley Kugel, which that Kugel competition could be at the two or the three or both or whatever um, for who was, would be that starting two guard and may the best man win, so to speak. Right. I think the floor here though, would be kind of that Jalen Coleman Lance role where it's like, yeah, you're kind of like the eighth, ninth man on the roster. Like you're going to get some minutes here or there. You'll come in for, you know, a handful plus of minutes in the regular season. You might play closer to 10 minutes a game. Um, come tournament time, it might get divvied down a little bit more, but we're going to bring you in situationally, maybe at the end of a half, try to steal a three here or there. And that's kind of the floor. Like either way, you're kind of a rot- rotation player. Um, and that's, like I said, kind of the floor scenario, which what would lead to that happening is like, um, you know, I guess a, like how he translates to the jump up in competition, but also what happens the rest of the off season. What if Johnny Furphy does come back? And then, you know, what if Zeke Mayo does hit and all of a sudden you're starting to want Zeke Mayo, I don't know, Riley Kugel, Johnny Furphy at the four cages coming off the bench at the, the six. And then it's just like, okay, there there's, 
you know, only so many minutes to go around and then you're fighting with Elmarco Jackson and LeBaron Phylon and, and what's going to happen there. Are you playing the Jalen Coleman ran lands role in, in that situation? Or are you just bar none the best, you know, shooter on the roster? And then it's like, we got to play you 20 minutes per game. Or do you end up being the best shooting guard or um, Elmarco Jackson transfers? And that's why Kansas does go after Colby Rogers. Cause they're like, okay, we have another scholarship or more minutes available at the, the uh, kind of shooting guard position. But I think either way, you know, it's a very useful player to have on the roster, whether it's insurance, whether it's as a back end rotation player that can be used in certain situations, or if it ends up being a player who plays, you know, big minutes and is one of your better scores and one of your better shooters on a team that needs more shooting to surround Hunter Dickinson with. If you are going to play too big basketball, even if it's not for 30 minutes a night, like you did this past season, even if it's for 10 minutes a night, even if it's for 15 minutes a night, Right? You need that shooting to kind of go around the roster, and this is a guy who does that. So if you're just looking at the skill fit, it's a home run. Um, and so I, I think you play off Dewan Harris perfectly, too, when you're talking about Colby Rogers. Like you're talking about a high-volume, efficient shooter who can also handle and run pick and roll to give him a little bit of a breather in some of those situations. He can run that pick and roll with KJ Adams or Hunter Dickinson or Floyd Badunga. Uh, I certainly think you know KJ is a great pick and roll uh, kind of big man forward type. Hunter Dickinson can be a good pick and pop big man. Flory Badunga, based on the athleticism and, and probably throwing down lobs, you would think, and you know, speed from a center spot, you would think he's going to be a good rim runner off a of pick and roll, right? You, if you have a couple guards, Dwan Harris and Colby Rogers, who can execute that, and then Zeke Mayo too, who can run some pick and pop actions with Hunter Dickinson, where if you go under the screen, then Zeke Mayo shoots it. If you go over the screen, Hunter Dickinson gets open on a pick and pop. There's a lot that Kansas could kind of do there if you have all of this. And it would also allow you even like you could throw out lineups. And I'm not saying this would start or anything, but like this could be a lineup that you use for portions of the game where you have Dewan Harris at the one and Zeke Mayo at the two and Colby Rogers at the three. Or I guess it doesn't really matter which one's technically the two and which one's technically the three. But you get what I mean. You might say, oh, that's a three guard lineup. Well, uh, that's basically what Houston did this past year, right? I mean, it was it was LJ Cryer, Jamal Shedd, and Emmanuel Sharp at like the one, two, and three. And Cryer is is a smaller guard. Uh, Sharp is what, like six two, something like that. And that was very effective for them with having three guys who could kind of create and shoot the basketball. And that would be kind of the opportunity, you know, uh, not that that would be maybe the primary lineup or anything, but the type of ideas you could get with having another shooter and another creator on the floor. And I think more than anything, again, it's just that floor of shooting. You're looking for more shooting. You're looking for a floor, a baseline of shooting that can get you through the season and open things up for the guys on the inside as well and open things up for Dewan Harris. And he could be a weapon in a small role. He could be a weapon in a big role. So, uh, you know, whether it's the Isaiah Moss role, who ended up being a starter at the end of his season, playing 25 minutes a game, or whether it's a Jalen Coleman lands role, which is still a, a valuable rotation piece at the end of the bench. And, you know, it comes through for a few games here or there. Like either way, that is valuable. So for me, this is absolutely a take in general, but I do also understand KU is full on scholarships and it has to come at the result of something else happening. So I don't think it's, it's to the situation of, cause I I've continued to say this, I think Bill Self does better with um, retaining internal talent and having those players go through, you know, the program. So I'm not saying show somebody to do the door to bring him on. I'm just saying if somebody else does transfer, like let's say somebody leaves the program or you decide you want to use the 13th scholarship this year or Johnny Furphy decides to stay in the draft. Um, obviously, maybe there are, there are players like AJ Store where they would be like number one on on the wish list or something. But you certainly couldn't go wrong with a guy like Colby Rogers, and I think you'd be a real nice fit for KU. All right, let's finish up here. Redoing this past off season to make KU a much better team. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, this episode of Locked on Jayhawks is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's playoff time in the NBA, NHL. Baseball's in full swing, the Masters are going on, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to dunks to hole-in-ones, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Network. 
Let's redo the off season for uh, KU. I don't even uh, want to go through like the whole ripple effects things, but uh, certainly some things that would have changed things a little bit more. KU had a lot of, it seemed like interest with Harrison Ingram and then maybe slow played him too much. He ended up going to North Carolina and putting up really good numbers and being a good three point shooter. I don't know. Uh, that one becomes interesting because it's like, in theory, he was a good player and would have helped them shooting the ball. But I also don't know that a lineup where Harrison Ingram's the three, KJ's the four, flip-flop, whatever you want to say, Hunter's the five, if that really does fix anything. So I don't know. Uh, I, I guess on paper, maybe that one isn't as great. Um, I think if you could go back in time to last year, why was Kansas not more in on like Dalton Connect? I, you were looking for offense. Like would have wouldn't Connect have been like the perfect – player to play off of Hunter Dickinson and to really help K. I mean, Dalton connect is going to be like a first round pick and was an all American. He would have been perfect for a lot of teams. Right. But uh, I don't know. You, it was just weird that the Kansas never really felt like they were in the running. Maybe that was just Tennessee was, was so on top of it from the early get go that it was just kind of their race to, to win. Um, Cam spent Spencer. That would be a nice, there's the alternate world where, you know, Nick Timberlake chooses UConn. And Cam Spencer ends up going to KU or something. I don't know. Maybe at that point he goes somewhere else. But like, could you imagine if those two things are flipped? I don't know. Is it, UConn just pasted everybody in the title game. So it's like, it's hard to say if you take one player off, does that change it? But it might. Cam Spencer was excellent. And he would have been perfect for Kansas. You're talking about a guy who can uh, play excellent defense, would have helped, uh, you know, kind of insulate Hunter Dickinson a little bit more, really good three-point shooter, uh, really good working in the lane and, and kind of creating stuff for your offense. But that one also very tough to fault KU and Bill Self because it was so late in the game. The Caleb Love one, that was uh, very divisive for all fan bases when he entered the portal. Like, do you want him? Do you not? Turns out, I, I know the Sweet 16 game was bad, but turns out, like, he was Pac-12 player of the year and he specialized in creating shots. Turns out that would have uh, worked out pretty well for Kansas. Uh, you look at the, I don't know, I was always perplexed why Kansas didn't go more after like a guy like Max Acemas or Tyler Perry. Maybe that was just more about, um, you only have a limited amount of NIL funds. As much as Kansas, there was that story that just came out that like Kansas is the top of the top. Well, there's still a limit to it, right? If, if the top is $5 million a year in NIL, there's still a, a cap on that and how much you can spend. And, with how much you, you probably had to spend on Hunter Dickinson and Nick Timberlake and some of these guys that maybe you just didn't have enough money to bring on a guy like Max Asmus. But I was always curious why that didn't happen. The Jalen Tyson one was tough. And and at the time you didn't know if he was going to get the, the waiver to be eligible right away. So you can sort of excuse that a little bit more, but like, he might be a first round draft pick. Now he put up unbelievable numbers at Cal, a really good three point shooter, averaged like 20 points per game. He would have kind of been perfect. Low key Jaden Bradley, who they, there was some reported interest. I don't know truly how much would have been great pickup for KU. Um, I think just in general, when you're looking at this, if you were to say, if they just use the scholarship on Arterio Morris or you switch Nick Timberlake with maybe a more reliable player, like, would that have been enough? Would one, additional good guard like hypothetically if it was Jalen Tyson in that instance would that have been enough for this team to make some noise and it really might have been because like let's say it was Jalen Tyson for instance you'd be talking about then Kansas having a, a starting lineup if hypothetically it was you know Dewan Harris Jalen Tyson if Kevin McCuller is healthy um, uh, Johnny Furphy and Hunter Dickinson with McCuller, Tyson, and Furphy, that would be three like basically projected top 40 picks in the NBA draft all on the wing with Hunter Dickinson and Dewan Harris. Like, I feel like that would have worked, you know? Um, so I don't know. Is there something to the idea of maybe you actually would have been better off, you know, not bringing on Hunter Dickinson in terms of the, the NIL money that you would have saved by not bringing him on? Could you have brought on a player like Dalton Connect and maybe some of these other players that, that took up a lot of money on and to where you would have had way less offensive production, but Ernest Duda and Zuby Edifor would have stayed and maybe your defense would a little bit have been a little bit better. I don't know. It's hard to fault that because Hunter Dickinson was a second team all American, just kind of thinking out loud here. But um, I, I do think there were a lot of avenues, I guess is my point in going over all this, a lot of different players that they showed interest at different times. And I, I think my point is like, I guess it, it's very easy to see this last off season and go, yeah, Bill Self struck out in the transfer portal. Are we sure he's good at the transfer portal, but I almost feel like it was just kind of a snake eyes type of year. Now, if he continues to struggle in the transfer portal, then maybe we point to something, but like, it's still such a small sample size. It still hasn't been around that long. 
I have a hard time believing Bill Self, the best coach in college basketball, just can't figure something out, can't figure out the transfer portal at all. And so I almost view it as like, hey, you just had a year where you just rolled snake eyes in the transfer portal. I mean, Nick Timberlake, UConn and North Carolina wanted him. Those were both one seats. Maybe that means there's a little luck coming your way. Maybe that means that, you know, you're going to swing for the fences this time. And instead of striking out, you're going to hit a double or you're going to hit a home run or something like that. Right. At least that's the hope of, of where it is. But point being, like, maybe just one move differently was enough to do it. And. I don't know, like at the time we thought Kansas had a home run off season. So I, I don't know what that means moving forward. Like, do we just hesitate, even if it is a home run off season to be like, okay, let's pump the brakes here. Or do you just say, Hey, if you continue to have home run off seasons, there's a better chance that, you know, eventually one of them is going to hit. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I think we'll find out a little bit more this off season for KU. I right, that'll do it for this episode of the show. We'll have a spring showcase preview coming up tomorrow on that edition of LOJ. Find our show anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page. We'll see you then.